Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi, Kevin. Hello. Hello, everyone. Peachy. Peachy. I'm trying some new lights. So let's see how it goes. Hoping for less glare and more light. Well, I know some people can't make it tonight, so we'll hope a couple others wander in as we go. But so if we're starting a new series tonight, as you guys know, or some of you might know, and the request was to cover the stories we all learned in Sunday school. So I don't know that I went to Sunday school, same place you did. So if you have stories that you think of when you think of Sunday school stories, let me know and I'll add them to the list. Obviously, I thought we'd start with David and Goliath. I thought that seemed like the quintessential Bible story to me, so or Sunday school Bible story. So let me know uh, the stories that you want to study, and I will try to keep a list, and we'll try to go through some of them. I can't promise to do all of them, because when I started making a list, I realized that we could probably spend the next several years just in Genesis, doing all the stories in Genesis, and not get through them all, so... Does anybody have any, any Sunday school Bible stories they want to make sure we cover before we get started tonight? Okay, uh, Cindy and Stephanie, you're just joining us. We're getting a list of the Bible stories that you want to cover as Sunday school Bible studies or stories. So are you having any ideas? I have Samson and Delilah. I have Noah's flood or Noah in the ark. Um, what else would I said? So, someone else that I said. Um, Joseph. Yes. The Joseph story. No Technicolor dream coat. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but the walls of Jericho. Um, how about like some of the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob stuff? Yeah. Or um, Elijah. Oh, Elijah and oh, Elijah. Elijah. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? Daniel. Jonah, yeah, Jonah. Oh yeah, you got a couple of Jonah, you got a couple of Daniel issues going on there. All right, any New Testament story you guys think of? Fiery furnace. All right, Daniel and fiery furnace, good. That's going to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three three guys in the fiery furnace, and Daniel lines in. So Shadrach, Meshach. Okay. Eating of the five thousand. All right, 5,000. The raising of Lazarus. Oh, that's a good you, one. You win there because that's in John. So, Lazarus, feeding 5,000 is also in John. So, that's good. See, now we're, now we're getting, now we're hitting our stride. All right. Well, that's a, that's quite a list. So, we'll, uh, that'll take us a several weeks to get through those. So if you think of other ones you want to get through, let me know and we'll try to get a list going. I don't know if we're going to spend the rest of our lives doing this, but we'll, we'll do this for a while and, and see how it goes. So tonight, today, whatever, wherever you are, we are going to talk about um, David and Goliath 
said kind of the quiz essential Sunday school Bible story. Also the one that probably um, is interpreted in, in um, some of the most blatantly strange ways. So we'll, we'll get to some of that as we go. Um, so, yeah, so let's, let's pray and then we'll get to our study and we'll, we'll kind of talk about all this. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we gather around your word, we do thank you that we've been instructed in your word since we, many of us, since we were very little. As we've grown up with these stories and these characters and these heroes of the faith, we pray that you would continue to strengthen our faith through your holy word, that as we, as we read these words of yours, we believe that they are true words. They are words that point us to you and your glory, but especially in your love for us and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So bless our time in your word. May we, like newborn infants, crave pure spiritual milk and so grow up in your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to have everybody here and a couple of new friends and, and some of us who've been around together for a while. So, so welcome. And everybody online, good to see you. We are beginning our, our series on Sunday School Stories. So fun stuff. And um, tonight we are going to look at David and Goliath, like I said, and hopefully you got the sheet online. If not, I'll ask the questions out loud anyway, but um, that's how it works. So the first thing is before you even really look at 1 Samuel 17, which is where you have the story of David and Goliath. Um, there are a couple of things to talk about the story, but, but before we get there, and we're going to kind of go over this several times as we, as we meet about these stories. The first thing we want to remind ourselves, number one on your sheet. Who is the main character of the Bible? Who's the main Jesus. character? Jesus. Okay. So the main character of the Bible is Jesus. And, and as we've talked about before in this class, but I just want to review it as we start looking at these, these, school, these stories we've known our whole lives, perhaps, is that what that means is to interpret the scriptures correctly, we're going to read them as though the entire story of the Bible points us to Jesus, okay? So what this means is, if you're going to use a big fancy word, is we read the, word, the Bible Christocentric, okay? Like it's a big, big circle with Christ in the middle of it, okay? So the whole thing revolves around Jesus. The whole thing points us to Jesus. Another way to look at this is that Jesus is the goal, okay? So all of scripture is going to get us to Jesus. So whether it's Old Testament or whether it's New Testament, you want to read the Bible with your focus on Jesus, okay? Now, the, the problem for us in all of this, there's, there's a couple issues that come up when we start talking this way is I don't think anybody would really disagree with those statements. I think most every Christian, most Bible believing person would say, well, yeah, duh, you haven't taught us anything new yet. That's kind of basic, but, but it gets actually harder when it gets down to interpreting passages and interpreting stories and interpreting sections of the Bible, because right away we try to apply it to our lives which is fine. The Bible is certainly written um, to us or for us in many ways. But, but what we do a lot of times is we skip this. We skip this focus on Jesus. And what we try to do is we say, okay, we're going to read this Old Testament story and we're going to say, it's about me. Okay. So I'm going to try to identify with something in the Old Testament story. But that's really not the best way to read the Bible or even a correct way to read the Bible. But instead, what we want to say is this story in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. And so the only way I participate in the story of the Old Testament is because of Jesus and through Jesus. OK, and this is the same then for the New Testament. Even when you read the New Testament, you want to say, well, I'm just going to apply it straight to me. No, what you want to do, is you say, OK, this New Testament story points me to Jesus and the way I participate in the story is through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how I, in 2022, or whatever year you end up watching this on YouTube or wherever, that's how I, in the current time, relate to this these stories of the Bible in the Old and New Testament. I relate to them 
because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So all of these stories are going to point us to Jesus, and then they apply to us because of his death and resurrection. If you get rid of this, if you do not go through Jesus, it's really interesting. You end up reading the Bible as not a Christian text or not a Christian book, but instead maybe just a book of morals or a book of fables or a book of legends, okay? Or a book of like, um, you think of Aesop's fables or something like that. And that gets a real, real problem is you start reading God's own book, not about God at all, but actually ends up being about me, okay? And so that's the first thing we want to say in all this is that when we say the main character of the Bible is Jesus, we actually mean to read every passage of scripture, every story in scripture, every book in scripture as pointing us to Jesus. And that means the first thing we want to ask any story in the Bible is what does this teach us about Jesus? Okay. How does this get us to understand better, to, to put our faith in Jesus Christ as God's son, the savior of the world, his death and resurrection. And then if we want to say, how am I included in that? And we say, okay, how does the death and resurrection of Christ bring me into this reality of this story? Rebuilt? Okay. So that's kind of the move we're going to make together as we go through these stories. Any questions so far or thoughts on that? Now, I, I kind of doubt that your Sunday school teachers did this. Okay, and that's kind of the point of what we're going to do in these stories that we all learn in Sunday school is most Sunday school teachers, um, and I've taught Sunday school, so don't worry, I'm picking myself too sometimes. Um, when, you, when you kind of first start teaching the Bible, the first thing you do is you try to find ways to relate the story to the kids. And so you end up having a bunch of moral lessons. So like you can emulate David and David and Goliath in these ways, or you can emulate um I guess you could emulate Goliath if you wanted to in these ways, or don't be like Goliath, right? Or whatever, something like that. And, and okay, but, but what you're doing is you're actually, actually teaching kids moral lessons, not about Christ. And that's, so that, that's kind of how we're going to attack these stories, not attack in a bad way, but kind of go after these stories is, is to really say, how are these stories Christian stories? Meaning how are they about Christ? Okay. And what you're going to find is that these stories actually get to be much richer than you remember them. They're actually a much larger and richer story and mean more to us. So it's fun. Trust me. Okay. Questions or thoughts? So speaking as somebody who regularly teaches religion and, you know, Bible stories um, and working on keeping it Christocentric, what what would you would you recommend starting from that position or how would how would you go about that? So I think one of the one of the wonderful things you can ask children when you read a story is to and I don't want to give away the rest of the study. So, you know, I don't know yet, but but you know, I don't want to spoil it for you. But I think the first question you want to ask of a text is what does this teach us about God? train children to start thinking that when they read a Bible story. What does this Bible story teach me about God? Instead of how do you relate to the story, start the conversation about, okay, we just read about, um, you know, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. What does this story teach us about God? Start the conversation by asking them about God. And then when you start talking about God things, where then you kind of get to the questions of, okay, God, maybe, maybe let's just do Joshua and Jericho real quick. So we don't ruin our study tonight, but, but how did God protect his people or what did God do for his people? Well, he defeated Jericho, right? In a miraculous way. Well, what does God do for his people, right? What does God do for his people overall? And it's like, well, he sent his son, Jesus. Yeah, exactly. And so we have this, this old Testament story. When the first question is, what does he say about God? It's going to get us to start the conversation about how is God doing something to help his people, right? And then we can start teasing that out and say, okay, the Old Testament, he was helping his people Israel. In the New Testament, his people are the church, right? And this is how he helps. 
and and now we're part of the church and you're so you're teaching the kids you're part of the church you're you're now somebody that god has done something to help to to you you are now one that god has worked to save right and and so i think those are ways to help even children kind of walk into the stories of the bible from a, from a god-centered and christ-centered point of view ask them questions that help them start thinking about god right away does that make sense yes it makes a lot of sense thank you you're welcome and i, I, may, I, have a, I may have a poster made yeah yeah what does this teach about god and what has god done for for his people and for you it's it those are good questions of course they're not questions i asked tonight somehow but that's okay we'll get there all right it's number two are right, any other questions on that or thoughts All right, number two. So what is the central message of the Bible? If the central character is about Jesus, what's the central message? What is, what is the point? What is the Bible trying to get its readers to do or to think or to believe? Or what, what is the message of the Bible? Or if someone walked up to you and said, what's the Bible about? What would you John, say? John 3.16. Okay, John 3.16. What does that mean? God has sent, sent his son to save you Good. and Good. the world. Good. Okay. So it's something, something, somehow, the central message is going to be on God saving you. And how does he do that, Susan? Sending his son. Right. Through the death and resurrection of his son, right? So, so when we say the Bible's about Jesus, right? He's the central character, but the central message of the Bible is what we call justification, right? That's the big fancy word for being saved. Justification by grace. I can't write tonight, forgive me. By grace, through faith. You guys are saying you can't ever write. Nothing new there. And, and by grace, through faith, because of Jesus, right? on account of Christ. And so we say, this is the central message of the Bible. Now, just like we said with the first thing, with Jesus being the central character, and we want to interpret everything as pointing to Jesus, we also want to read everything in the Bible as pointing to this reality, that God saves people. Now, that means a couple of things right away. First thing, and this is very offensive to a lot of people, I actually know somebody who, who has kind of walked away from the faith because of this, they're offended at the idea that they need, they need saving. They're offended by the idea that they would need saving. But that's one of the most important things the Bible says is that every human needs God to save them. Without God's intervention, every human is lost. So that's part of the message of the Bible. And then, the, and then the, the central part of it then is, is God is the one who's actually taken the action to save us. And so we are justified. We are declared righteous. We are forgiven of our sins by God's grace. And it's because of what Jesus did. And we receive all that, not by earning it, by doing things, but by believing in Jesus. Okay. By believing what the, what the scriptures teach about what Jesus has done. So what this means is, as we look at these Old Testament, a lot of these Old Testament, even New Testament Sunday school stories, we want to read them as though they're about Jesus and they're teaching us how God has saved sinners by grace through faith because of what Christ has done. Okay, now what that means, now pay attention to this. What that means is that the Bible is united in its message. Nothing in the Bible is going to be contrary to those two ideas, Christocentric and justification by grace through faith. Those two things are going to work in every story. Okay. I'm not saying I can explain how it works in every story, but it, that is how it works in every story. And it's our job to keep reading and studying and, and trying to figure out how these disparate stories sometimes tie into that grand story, that grand reality, so that everything is, is 
kind of coherent. It's all kind of holding together. Because remember, the Bible written by lots of different humans, right? Lots of different humans wrote the Bible. Lots of different authors over thousands of years in three different languages. But remember, all inspired by the same Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's one overall author of scripture, the Holy Spirit, even as he worked through different human authors at different times. Okay, so that Holy Spirit inspired all these authors to tell the same overall theological truth all about Christ, but they told it from different places in different times. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions on that one? I know this is harder in the Old Testament than the New Testament, but what, that's kind of what we're going to do together, these, these Old Testament stories. So number three, how important then is the original setting of the story? This is the third thing to keep in mind when you're reading the Bible. You want to read about Jesus. You want to read about justification by grace through faith, but you don't want to discount the original setting of the story. So David and Goliath did not happen after the resurrection of Jesus. It happened before. That matters. David and Goliath happened before Israel went into exile in Babylon. That matters. David and Goliath happened after the period of the judges, after the Exodus. So now all of a sudden, the setting of the story matters. And we don't want to discount it and say, oh, it's, it doesn't matter when this happened. doesn't matter who the characters were. It doesn't matter the political things going around the world. We're just going to read it all as some kind of myth or legend. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to read it as actual historic events. So we believe that there actually was a young shepherd king named David, right? And there really was a giant named Goliath. And... There really is a valley in Israel. Um, you know, hey, our good friend Jeremy, who usually joins us, he's actually in Israel. That's why he's not on class today. He's actually in the Holy Land. And he was texting me pictures of this, this valley. Um, I'm not smart enough to figure out how to do this. But if I could, I would show you the picture. Let me see. I'm an old dude trying to use technology. This could be a little scary for everybody. Okay. Now, there it is. There's the valley where David and Goliath happened, all right? And he drew on it for us. If you can see the blue lines, those are uh, the, the Philistines and the little green circle there at the top, that's where the Israelites were encamped. And this valley down here, that's the valley where the battle kind of took place between David and Goliath. So Jeremy's there. He said to say hi to everybody and he sent us pictures. So we, now I think he did the drawing. I don't think when you go there, you actually see the drawings. I think that's something Jeremy added for you. I don't think that God actually, you know, wrote in the sky. I do that, not, not, not him. So, so there it is. Um, you can picture a little David and Goliath over there. But, but the cool thing about, about that and, and even the fact that our good friend Jeremy is, is there in the Holy Land for us and with us. Um, is, is that it reminds us, you can go to these places. These are historical events that happened on earth. Um, it's, not, it's not made up. It's not some kind of myth or legend. So, so as we read biblical texts and we're saying we're going to read about Jesus, we're also going to take it very seriously that this took place, you know, a thousand BC or so, you know, and there actually was a guy named David and a, and a big guy named Goliath. And there actually were Philistines and Israelites. And these are real places on earth. Um, there were actual battles and people actually died. Um, so, so we take it very seriously that the text in its original setting. Okay. So we're not just going to ignore the setting to run to Jesus. We're going to take it very seriously that God worked in this situation in history um, to, to do something for his people. And that all of that's going to point us ahead to Christ and justification hey, by grace. Through Kevin, can I ask a question? Yes, please do. Um, so as a kid, I always wondered, how big was Goliath? I mean, does it ever say how big he was? Or yeah, I don't he, it does, actually. It says that he's about six and a quarter cubits. Okay, six cubits and a hand breadth. So that's, that's about six and a quarter or six and a half cubits, depending on how you measure your, your hand and your cubit. Cubit is the length from your elbow to your fingertip. 
Okay. So it's about a foot and a half. And he's six and a quarter of those. He's, he's a little over nine feet tall. Okay. So he's a pretty big dude. Nine feet tall. Um, so yeah, he's literally a giant. And the, the irony is, or not irony, but kind of it's interesting is that there's there's evidence of several people this size kind of running around. There were there were kind of big guys back then. Um, so yeah, he was literally a giant. Um, took to us, you know. I I've, I've seen people that are like seven feet tall, and we think, whoa, that's tall. But so was it intentional nine. that he was by by God? Was it intentional that he was that big to yeah. play a role in a story, or was he just like a? And I don't want to say freak of nature, but was yeah. it just like a hybrid? Well, um, like I said, there actually seemed to be evidence that there were there were some of these guys walking around that were giants, and they would. I mean, obviously, if you have a guy in your kingdom that's nine feet tall, he's going to be your, you know, he's going to be your lead warrior. He's going to go out there and kind of be the guy that intimidates the rest of the armies. And, you know, we don't have a lot of nine feet tall guys running around. So it would scare you to death, I think. And it does. I mean, if you read the story, this guy walks out and the entire Israelite army is like, uh -uh, I ain't, uh -uh, I'm done. I'm not fighting that guy. Right. I mean, that's part of the plot. So you're right. Yes. God uses his size in this story to teach us something. And we're going to look at what that is. So that's very true. But yeah, he seemed about nine feet tall, which is big. Really big. Some of us are maybe half that size. So yeah, that's a big guy. All right. So let's actually read the text. Um, and the problem is this is a very long story. And this is the other thing that I, I noticed as I was as I was reading some of these Bible stories is that I didn't read this much of the Bible in Sunday school. We got some kind of condensed version because like in my Sunday school lesson, it was bang, 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 we're done. But this is a long, it's actually all of chapter 17, which goes on for a very long time. It's literally 58 verses. So it's pretty long. So let's see. Let me just read this. And, I, and I, I'm not not because you guys can't read, but sometimes the audio gets weird. So let, let me just read this and I'll try to read the story. Here we go. Verse 24. Obviously, we're starting in the middle, but here we go. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, that's Goliath, they fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now, Eliab, David's eldest brother heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and he spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again, as before, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against that Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will make one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord, who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go. And the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, 
I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David in a shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and with spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear the battle is the lord's and he will give you into our hand when the philistine arose and came and drew near to david to meet david david ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the philistine and david put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the philistine on his forehead the stone sank in his forehead and he fell to his face on the ground so david prevailed over the philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood of the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. So the wounded Philistines fell on the way to Sha'arim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. All right. So there's the, there's the David and Goliath part of the story. Obviously we missed the introduction, which introduces Goliath as a giant guy, the armies of Israel hiding. And um, if you don't remember, David is actually there to bring pizza to his brothers right? They're out there fighting the battle and, and David's dad's like, you know what? They probably had any pizza for a while. Why don't you go bring them some pizza? So, so David leaves his father's flocks in the field with a hired hand and goes on a pizza run to his brothers. And while he's there, he just kind of hears this. And that's how this all happened. So when his brother says, what did you, where'd you leave the sheep? He's accusing David of shirking his responsibility to his dad to come watch his brothers fight in the battle like a spectator okay that's why that exchange happens um obviously david's not doing that he's doing what he's supposed to be doing so so number four so who is the main character of this story and it's not jesus that's not the answer i'm not trying to get you to say jesus like literally in the story if you're telling the story who's the main character david david okay so now we are reading a story about david and this is, this is very important. So right away, we've got to figure out if the main character of the Bible is Jesus, the first thing we should ask ourselves is how does David point us to Jesus? Okay, if David is the main character, the question is, how does David get us to Jesus, right? Is David the Christ figure in the story? Is he doing something that's going to point us ahead to something that Jesus does? Well, right? Jesus that's was right. a descendant of David. Okay. So right away we said, well, there's a literal genealogical connection between the two. So Jesus is the son of David. Okay. And we'll look at some of those passages in a bit. And... Right? Beyond that, David's reign was kind of considered the golden age of Israel, and that's what they were always trying to get back to, it seems. Okay, so, so not yet, right? Not yet, but David is going to become the king. Well, he actually has been anointed in chapter 16, but Saul's still king over Israel at this point. But David is going to become the king of Israel, and Jesus, have you ever noticed that Jesus is always walking around in the Gospels talking about the kingdom of God? 
right? So Jesus comes to reign in the kingdom of God. All right, so you have this king tie between these two guys, all right, which might also kind of be what the son of David is referring to as well. All right, any other ties that you think between David and Jesus? Both carry out God's will. Good. So David is a man after God's own heart, right? He's a man after God's own heart. Right? Meaning he does God's will. And Jesus obviously does God's will. Now, here's where, as we do these things, as we read Old Testament story, you say, well, this character is like Jesus. I know every one of you is saying, not so fast. David wasn't exactly as good as you're making him sound, right? So he always did God's will, right? Eh, except those times when he really messed up, right? So, so that's where we remember is that David is not Jesus. There's this aspect of him that points ahead to Jesus, and Jesus is going to do, he's going to fulfill it. He's going to be the fulfillment of all the things that David did partially. Okay, so David was a king, but, but he's, he's not, not the eternal king. But he's not right? divine. He's not divine. Okay, so Jesus is his son, but not like Solomon was his son. He's the eternal son of David. So, so we see that Jesus fulfills us even greater. So good. So right away, we're in the story and we're saying, okay, David is kind of going to be maybe, maybe our Christ-like figure. which kind of eliminates, now, now just think this through with me for a second, which kind of eliminates David representing me. Most people read the story with David representing them. Okay, do you guys see the difference? Like I would go up against a giant Yes, most people <laughs> interpret it that way. Uh -uh, not me. Look it up and any, just look it up and you will find most pastors will say, slaying your giants, overcoming the obstacles in your life. How are you to, what are the five smooth stones in your satchel to put in your sling to face your giant? Okay. And what have they done? I'm not insulting them. I'm not insulting them. My point is, as we interpret scripture, what have we done? We have made David not represent Jesus, but me. Okay. And, and now what have we done to the story? We've removed it from this whole reality of, of what God has truly done to save sinners, including me. If, if I am David, then who's saving me? Right? See, so that's that's why as we as you read these stories that we learned as children, we're gonna we're gonna open them up to even a richer understanding of them as we see the, the glory of God in the face of Christ in the David and Goliath story, in the battle of Jericho, in Abraham, in all these stories, we're gonna see the richness of God saving his people in the person of Jesus Christ, okay? So number five, we got the main character down. That's pretty good, it's pretty easy. Oh, well, before we get before we go too far, we shouldn't, we shouldn't go too far without doing this. What, there are other characters in the story. So just other big characters. We got Goliath, okay? So we got Goliath. So if, if Jesus, if David equals Jesus, then who's Goliath? Devil. Yeah. Okay. So he's, he's the enemy of Jesus, right? He's the enemy of God's people. Okay. So he's, he's the enemy of God's people. I don't know why I can't write it. Okay. So he's God's people's enemy. I don't know if I'm gonna call him the devil yet, but, but somehow Goliath, if David points us ahead to Jesus, then the one that David is opposed to we're going to kind of see, okay, so now this is God defeating his, the, the enemy of his people. And we're going to see maybe, maybe how does this point ahead to what Jesus did to defeat our enemy? Now, 
We're not going to get there yet, but that's just kind of how to do characters. What's another character? I say Saul. Saul. Who's Saul's sent, a big who, character. Yeah, who right? sends David. It, he kind of sends him or almost yeah. him in a way. Well, and, and so here's what I want you to do. Let's, let's look at our Bibles real quick. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16, the very end of 16, the very beginning of 17. So same, chapter 17 is David and Goliath. So 1 Samuel, the end of 16, right? Okay. And we're going to look at, um, well, let's see. Is this, was this, that's not the best way to do it, is it? Let's not do it there. Let's do it here. Let's go to four, 16, verse 14. This is actually a little clearer. Chapter 16, verse 14. I'm sorry. I keep telling you the wrong verses. It's just a bad night. 16, 13, and then 14. That's what I'm thinking in my head. I'm just saying it backwards. First Samuel, chapter 16, verse 13. Samuel, the prophet Samuel, who, by the way, anointed Saul as king earlier. So Samuel now took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. Now listen to this. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that point forward. Okay. And then verse 14 says, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So what do we have going on here in Israel? We have the change of anointed kings. Okay. We have the spirit of the Lord now resting on David and no longer on Saul. Okay. Does that make sense? Is so, that sort of, I, I could see somebody looking at that and saying, well, did God make a mistake when he had Samuel anoint Saul first? No, he didn't because, okay, very good. So that needs, leads to the next point is that there's actually a tie between David and Saul, but look at this. There's also a tie between Saul and Goliath. And I think this is something that, that we really need to, to ponder for a second as we look at what's going on here in the history of Israel. Because when Israel wanted a king, remember God's first answer to them wanting a king was no. You don't want a king because I'm your king. Okay, remember, don't, don't ever forget this. As you're reading the Old Testament, one of the most important passages is Judges chapter 8. And we don't have time to return there right now. But Judges chapter 8, the people of Israel come to Gideon. Remember Gideon? He's the fleece guy. Okay. Gideon. And they say to Gideon, you and your son shall be kings over us. And Gideon says, no. For Yahweh is to be the king of Israel. All right. But at the end of the book of Judges, everyone does what is right in their own eyes because there is no king in Israel. And then they ask for a king. OK, and the reason they want a king is because they want to be like the other nations. So what do they do when they choose the first king? They choose a king who is head and shoulders above everyone else in stature. Saul is literally head and shoulders taller than everybody else in Israel. That's why they choose him, because he's a champion who can go out and win battles. Well, now look what you've got. You've got Israel's head and shoulders taller than everybody else king. He can lead us out in the battle against anybody because he's so big and strong. And he just met his match. As a matter of fact, he's outmatched. Okay. But who's going to come on the scene? Not, not King Saul, who's head and shoulders above everybody else, but King David, who's just this little shepherd boy. But he's going to walk into battle after God's own heart, right? And the battle belongs to the Lord, okay? So this is what this, this kind of the way that, that Sam, whoever wrote for Samuel is setting up this narrative for us is he's bringing us along in the story to show us that God saves his people, not in the way that other nations think about saving through military might and strength. No, what does David say? The, the battle is not with the sword or the spear. No, the battle belongs to the Lord. Okay. And the way he saves his people is through his anointed, right? He's going to save it through his anointed, which remember is Messiah, 
and New Testament, that's Christ. Okay, so the anointed Messiah, the Christ, is how God's going to save his people from their enemies, right? And this is this, so this is, we're kind of seeing what's going on here. Okay, yeah, isn't that fun? Now, what happened? Number five, what happened? Someone asked you what happened to David and Goliath. What happened? Well, David won. But I have another question. Where does yep. it say that Saul was afraid or couldn't handle Goliath? It says, okay, good. Um, it's in the beginning of the chapter. Okay, that's fine. We can get I can look it up later. So Philistines. When Saul, okay, verse 11 and 17. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Okay, so they're hiding. And that's that's kind of what, what carries through the rest of the text is that Israel's hiding. No one, even Saul, is not willing to go. Matter of fact, look, he puts his armor on David. Like, it's like, dude, why don't you wear the armor and go out? And I was like, oh, you take my armor. Okay, so that's that's kind of the way the story is told with Saul. All right, so so what happens? David kills Goliath. We know that. And, and I just want to bring this out for a second. That's the point of the story. David kills Goliath. Right? Like, that actually happened. Don't forget that. This isn't a metaphor for something else happening. This is actually the story of David killing Goliath. And that mattered for God's people, Israel. Without God, without David killing Goliath, Israel would have been in trouble. But he actually kills Goliath and he cuts off his head with his own sword. Like, that's pretty impressive. So he actually takes a sling slings a stone, hits him in his forehead, he falls over dead, he walks over, chops his head off with a sword. And then all of Israel chases down the Philistines. Okay? That's actually what happened in the story. Pastor, now, why, yeah, why did ahead. David pick up five stones when it only took one? Well, he probably, I mean, that's probably what he did when he was a shepherd. That's probably how many he kept in your pouch to, to uh, okay. you know. So it's not like lack of faith on david's part <laughs> no i think he's i mean he's he's already told us that, that he has experience doing this with lions and bears i'm sure you know i'm sure he's a good shot but i'm not i'm not just bringing one stone you know, <laughs> you know i mean you, you kind of you don't just bring one arrow in your quiver you kind of you fill that thing up so i think he just grabbed you know five stones put them in his bag and he's he probably thinks he can sling five times before the lion gets to him well, but remember, the thing about a sling is Goliath can't reach you yet with his giant sword. David is actually still a ways away when he's slinging. So he might be thinking, I got five shots at this before this guy gets too close. You know, I mean. Could it also be it. he's he's not assuming how God is going to defeat Goliath. He's just, I'm going to prepare the way I prepare. God's going to do yeah, yeah, whatever I mean, it is, is he wants to do. I have no idea what it is. I just know he's going to win. Well, he's he's. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I'm saying is that he's, he's done this with lions and bears. And so I think I think when you're protecting your sheep, you kind of grab you know, as many stones as you as you think you're going to need. Right. And if God grants you success on the first one, you kind of thank God and move on. But, you know, I don't. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't think he had read the story yet. So I think he's just yeah. And I, and I think that's that's kind of what I'm going to get away from, to be totally blunt is that I don't know that five stones makes any difference. I'm not actually sure that the Bible ever goes back and says, now remember David's five smooth stones. So they don't. Okay. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. We'll get there. Number seven, but number, number six. So where is God in the story? Well, David called him the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Good. So he is Yahweh Sabaot. That's what the, that's the Hebrew for that. Yahweh Sabaot is, is God of the armies or God of the, of the host. He's General Yahweh. He's in charge of the armies. Okay. So he's a Lord God Almighty. He's in charge of the armies. Good. Where is he in the action? With David. 
Yes. Okay, now don't miss this. He's with David. Why is he with David? What is he doing through David? He was anointed. Yes. And so what is he doing through his it anointed was his David? Spirit. His spirit was with David. Yes. Why? What was the point? Why did God work through David to kill Goliath? Because he believes in God's power. No. No. I mean, yeah, that's fine. No, but what was the goal of God working through David? God Overcome always works through means. To do what? Overcome save his people. Yeah, to overcome the enemy to save his people. That's yeah. the point. God is working through David to save his people. That's where God is. God is working through David to save his people. Why, Peter? Because God always works through means. And, and that means is primarily a person, okay? So God is incarnational. That's a big fancy word. But when you talk about the incarnation of Jesus, that's the taking on of flesh. So God works through people to do his will to deliver his people. This is something you learn in the Old Testament a lot. So what's David doing? David is literally killing a giant with a sling and a stone, but God is at work in David to rescue God's people. Okay? Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to kind of get us to a Christological interpretation of all this, right? Now we have God working through a person, an incarnated person, to deliver his people, right? So now we're seeing how David actually is a prophecy of Jesus Christ in his actions to slay Goliath because he's, this is God working through a man to deliver his people. Right. Okay. Look at this. I mean, now, now we got a story to tell. Now we got something to talk about. All right. So, so um, we'll get to the more weird, where is God questions as we go, but number seven, is this a parable? No. No. Anybody think it is? I think it's both is and isn't. Okay. Uh, it, it actually took place, but we've just gone through all the parables. Okay, stuff. good, good. Exactly right. Now, now what you just said is very important. It actually took place. Parables are made up stories. This is what I think most people do with these stories is they turn them into parables. Okay. And they start trying to interpret all the parts of the stories like you would a parable. And they say, well, since, since David is a type of Christ, then we're going to look at, you know, what does the sling represent? What does the stone represent? What does the armor represent? And what have we done? We've actually made this into a parable instead of reading it as a story. And I think, I think it is actually much better for us as, as readers of scripture and, and interpreters of scripture to actually look at this story overall and say, this is a historical event. The reason David used a sling is because that's what he used. That's how he did things. That's how he did his thing as a shepherd. Okay. I don't know. We want to attach any, any real meaning to that other than the overall meaning of how God saves his people through his anointed King. Right. And that's going to point us ahead to Christ. So what I'm getting at is in a parable, we always slow down and kind of say, well, what about this detail? What about that to you? How, what does that mean? What's the metaphor? Right. But this isn't a metaphor. This is a story. And David is not a metaphor. He's not a metaphor for Jesus. He's a type of Jesus. He's a prophecy. He's a physical prophecy that's going to be fulfilled in the person of Jesus. He's not a metaphor for Jesus. That's different. Okay? So I'm encouraging us to not read these Old Testament stories as parables or metaphors, but instead to read them as historical events that God worked through to deliver his people and they point us ahead to the way he's going to work in a greater way to save his people and fulfill his promises.
Does that make sense? Okay. Now, um, we've kind of already done eight. How does the story fit into the history of Israel? But, but it, it is an important thing as we go back and do kind of our three stages of, of what, how do we read this? And we already talked about the, the king idea, but what this means is that now David, now we're going to get into the part of scripture where ironically, because David is the one through whom God saves his people, Saul and David now become enemies. See? So we do have this Goliath-Saul parallel with the size and the champion, but now David's enemy for the rest of the story is going to become Saul. Saul's going to try to hunt down and kill David. Okay, and you have this weird intersection between Saul and David for the rest of their lives together. Okay, and that's really going to play out as we move into the, the kingdom of Israel and Jerusalem. Um, you even have this idea that David, you know, takes, he cuts off David's, or cuts off uh, Goliath's head, right? And, and he takes it to Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem isn't an Israelite city yet. It's still run by the Jebusites, okay? But now, now just, just think this through. You guys know these stories in your head. Jerusalem becomes David's city, okay? So this is kind of David starting to take over and reign from Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, Zion is going to become the city of God, the city of David. So we have this movement in the story. Um, we're going to read again about the sword of, of, um, of Goliath later, but also we, we, we now begin this transition between David and Saul and the, and the exchange of the king. We already saw the spirit, the spirit of God has departed from Saul and is now with David. The kingdom is also now going to transition, okay, until David becomes the quintessential king, okay? Now, what's going to happen after David, though, is because David is a man after God's own heart, but not totally. His sin is actually going to result in the kingdom being split in two. And the result of the kingdom being split in two is that the kings progressively fall away from Yahweh. Matter of fact, the northern kingdom really is never focused on Yahweh at all. The southern kingdom occasionally. But both kingdoms then are going to end up going into exile to foreign rulers who are stronger physically than Israel, just like Goliath. Okay. And what are they going to say? They're going to they're gonna want a king to defeat the enemy like Saul instead of David. And that's going to lead to their exile. So now the rest of the history of Israel is looking for a king who will deliver them from their oppressors. And this is the issue with Jesus. When he starts walking around saying, I'm bringing in the kingdom of God, they say, oh, you're finally going to overthrow Rome. You're finally going to be strong enough to overthrow our oppressors. But when he starts talking about humility, right? When he starts talking about humbleness and gentleness and meekness, people are like, how are you going to overthrow the Romans like that? Okay. And then, and then the, the ultimate reality is that God's anointed king is going to defeat the enemies in a way that nobody predicts through his death, through his death, right? And it just doesn't look like the right way it's going to end, but that's, that's what happens. Okay. Well, I just did nine, didn't I? Oops. Sorry. That was eight and nine combined. That was free. Sorry. I, I couldn't help myself. Okay. So yeah. So this is really how Jesus then fulfills the story. And I just want to show you this. Um, oh boy. How are we going to do this? We don't have enough time. Oh, well, here we go. Go to Matthew, the gospel of Matthew. We'll just really, we'll just look at Matthew since we're running out of time. And maybe Romans. But Matthew, go to Matthew chapter one, verse one. We've done this many times together, but I want to remind you of this. Matthew's gospel, one of the points of Matthew in his gospel is that Jesus is the son of David. Okay, and this is very important to Matthew in his gospel. So look at Matthew chapter one, verse one. First book of the New Testament, Matthew. First of four gospels. First three are synoptic. The fourth one was written by John, right? So. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels, named for their author. So that's why it's called Matthew, because Matthew wrote it. So he says this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is defined as three things. He's the Christ. That means anointed one. Look at the second title. He's the son of David. 
Okay, so this is big in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is going to be talked about as the, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. Okay, big things, big things. So then if you look at it, if you, if you look, you can look at the genealogy. It talks about David there beginning in verse uh, six. Okay, you got David the king. Now, go to uh, verse chapter one. We're still in chapter one. Go to verse um, 20. Verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David. Okay, so now Jesus is going to be born to Joseph. Both Mary and, and Joseph are tied to David, um, right? Even his adopted son or adopted father is, is son of David. And then in, in chapter 2, verse 1, now after this, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which is the city of David, okay? Now, we've got to skip ahead because we're running out of time. So let's go to the end of Jesus' life. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 verse 30 all right well we we should read 29 too because it's fun matthew 20 verse 29 and 30 just good stuff we've been talking about jericho and here here's jericho right here in the, in the new testament so since we've been mentioning jericho we'll, we'll bring it up there so matthew 20 verse 29 and they went out of jericho a great crowd followed him and behold there were two blind men sitting by the roadside and when they heard that jesus was passing by they cried out lord have mercy on us son of david See, they believe that Jesus is this fulfillment of this prophecy. So in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7 is the promise that David's son will sit on the throne of Israel and reign forever and ever. Okay, so these blind men call out David or son of David, save us. And then what happens? Look at chapter 21 of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 9. And the crowds that were, okay, this is, this is Palm Sunday. So he's going into Jerusalem, right? The city of David, Jerusalem, right? Remember that? And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, meaning save us, save us now to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, what did David do with Goliath? He went out to face him in the name of of the lord okay so see how see what this story is doing this is driving us to look at christ and to say okay in the old testament god saved his people through men like david how does his, he save his people today through david's son through through the greater david's greater son right so through david's perfect son his name is jesus how does god save his people today through jesus christ through his death and his resurrection see that's what david and goliath is about it's about god defeating the enemies of his people and saving his people through his anointed one through his christ and that's exactly what jesus does for us so 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 i we're going to kind of skip ahead we're out of time but what this means is when you go to say how does this story help you see you're not david you're not Goliath. You're the Israelites cowering in the background, unable to defeat this great enemy. And you need someone to save you. And guess what? God has sent the Savior. Trust that. And this is the one place where we do want to look at David a little bit as an example for us, just like we look at Jesus. And we say, Lord, teach me to have that kind of faith in your deliverer. Right? Let me have faith that not the way this world teaches me to think, but let me trust in the way you do things through Jesus, through, through your son, our savior, Jesus. Give me faith to trust in the way that you have forgiven my sins, that my enemies are defeated because of what you have done, right? And so it brings us into the story because guess what? Your baptism says you're part of God's people. You belong to God's people. You're, you belong to him. And now as the church, how has he saved you? Through his son, Jesus Christ. So that's kind of um, a richer way to read the text in a Christological way. Any quick questions before we go as a group? I can stick around and answer individual questions, but anything for the good of the group before we go? Okay. I hope that was fun.
right? It was fun for me. I hope it's fun for you guys. Um, so we'll do more Bible stories like that if you want. Um, I hope that was okay. We'll try again anyway. So give me another chance if it wasn't. And we'll do, um, I don't know what we'll do. We should do, you want to do Noah's Ark? Should we do Noah's Ark next? Go to Genesis. All right, we'll do Noah's that Ark. That one or next. Jericho is a good one too. Joshua and Jericho. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of Joshua and Jericho tonight. So maybe we'll do, hmm, let's do those the next two weeks. We'll do Noah and Jericho. We'll do those the next two weeks. Okay, Noah and then we'll do Jericho. All right, let's pray. And then I can stick around if anybody has any questions for me. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you continue to act out of love and mercy to forgive our sins and defeat sin, death, and the power of the devil for us that we don't deserve your love and your mercy. Help us to focus on Christ, to trust each and every day that our sins are forgiven because he has overcome through his death and his resurrection. As we read your scriptures, we read the continued story, how you save your people through your chosen instrument. Teach us to trust in your unfailing love. And Lord, empower us as we live our lives to be witness to that love to those that we meet. So we might invite them into this amazing, amazing good news that you love even sinners like us. Bless us now this night with the peace of your love in Jesus' name. Thanks, everyone. Christian said he wants to do the Veggie Tales versions. The, yeah, I actually talked to somebody about that today. So you <laughs> just watch Veggie Tales. Like, oh, they're <laughs> yeah. They're not quite as Christological. They have to talk like the little no. piece with their little British accents. Exactly. They're they like, are French. And French. Oh. That's right. <laughs>